Hi, it's Rob Moore here. Uh, hello from the Cayman Islands, and hello from everyone who's on the Cayman hey. legacy. Uh, we are discussing how to raise JV finance. So this is going to be a deep dive podcast, live feed, and live session on all things raising finance. If you have any questions about raising finance in the room, please make a note, I'll take them after. And if you're watching the live, please do just ask your questions in the thread below and I'll try and answer as many as I can. I'll start riffing as the Americans say and we'll see where we go and then I'll bring the questions in later. Um, so the first thing I think about raising finance, um, which a lot of people don't do, is having a folder of deals past and present. So Kim, could you pass that? Just zip it up and you're, um, not you, the folder, yeah. Um, so this is just what you wanna get. Um, this is a perfect example. So what's this? Is this A4, would you say? Could it fix yeah. A4 in it? So this is just a nice leather bound folio, I guess. Uh, and um, I think everyone should get one of these. It doesn't have to be an expensive one, but that is a nice one. And any deals you've done, past and present, keep them in that folder. Now, Matt, this is your session. You've done plenty of deals. Um, even if they're your own houses, even if they're deals that you've packaged and sold on to others, mm -hmm. um, deals that you've sold. Now, many of you in this room have got 20, 30 years experience in property. If you haven't got any experience in property yet, what you do is you put deals in there that you are viewing with a view to packaging up or deals that you're evaluating that you'd actually like to um, either um, you know, uh, flip or even convert. So there's an element of social proof in these deals um, because one element of doing joint ventures is having good deals. Now, many people that have mentored me over the decades in property have said uh, a great deal will always find the money. Well, I would say that's not always the case, but a great deal that's put out there enough and is seen by enough potential JV partners probably will find the money. Now, some JV partners that you'll uh, meet, you'll reach, they will be mostly interested in the deal itself. Um, and obviously getting to know you all this week, I know a lot of you have done a lot of deals. Like up until probably yesterday, you probably didn't know those two commercial deals that Adam had done. And they're good, one of them produces 45 grand a year for you, doesn't it? So that, you know, like the before shots, the after shots, the purchase price, the, the, the value after you've added value, the gross income, the net income after all costs, a little bit, maybe a half or one pager about the area, all needs to be in a, a folio like that. If you imagine, you know, like when you had one when you were at school and you had these um, plastic wallets inside, um, and so you could have um, one page and then a reverse page. So each deal could be two pages, but one page. So they can look at the, the, the before and after photos of the, the deal uh, and then the sort of top line figures underneath it and then they can turn the page and then there can be a bit more detail, a few more photos and a bit about the area. And so each page turn is a deal. Uh, and over time, and even when you're starting out, you're gonna have a good few deals in there. Now you don't have that to stick under someone's face as soon as you meet them. You have it with you at all times such that when you start talking about deals, you've got deals there. And it, it doesn't look like you've brought all the deals with you to sell someone. It looks like you carry the deals with you wherever you go. Um, and Kim, could you pass that back again? Thank you very much. Um, so, so you get one like this, uh, and then you put it in a laptop bag or a bigger handbag, and it's just something that you always happen to have with you, um, so that it can seem pretty um, sort of fortuitous or accidental that you're showing it to them rather than, oh, I brought this ready to pitch you. Uh, I've told a lot of people that. Sorry, I keep putting my nose really close to the camera there. Uh, I've told a lot of people that and they still don't do it and it's a very simple thing. Now also, if you think about it from your point of view as a property investor, why wouldn't you want a copy of every deal you've done past and present? It's like your own sort of photo album, but of your property investing journey, you'd kind of want one anyway. Um, and then when, pe when people ask you, oh, you, you just, yeah, I always just keep my deals, you know, and you can go back. And if some of you in the room have done deals 20 years ago, that unconsciously says, this person's been in property 20 years, even if it was the first house you ever bought. Um, 
you know, I know Matt, some of the earlier deals you did, they were sort of individual flips really with a mini conversion. Also, someone could see your journey. Oh, this is a property. He's just extended it and sold it. This one um, is a bit bigger of an extension. This one is developing and building three houses. This one's a conversion. So they can see the history and your experience. And you're not selling to them when they're looking through a folder. And by the way, when they're doing that, you just shut up and just let them look through it. Maybe even, um, oh, do you just mind if I check a couple of emails? So let them do it because otherwise if you're like, oh yeah, that deals this and that deals that, you, you're kind of selling to them. Um, so that's the first thing I would definitely do. Um, the next thing is, when it comes to joint ventures, you want to imagine that you don't need the money and you want to build the relationship as if you don't need the money. Now, what a lot of people do is they don't really do anything. And when they need the money, they're posting in Facebook groups. You know, they're pitching to people. And, and I respect that because they're prepared to pitch to get the money. And sometimes you have to pitch to get the money. But there's a couple of things on that. One, if people think you want them only for, your, for their money, you're going to get a much lower conversion and you're going to push some people away. And two, there are FC regulation, FCAA regulations uh, around pitching for joint ventures. And actually, when it comes to a JV where there's equity involved, you can't properly pitch until you've got some evidence that they're a sophisticated investor or a high net worth. Uh, I wouldn't get too stuck up on, on that at the moment, but I would just say, it's better for them to come to you than for you to come to them because of those um, regulations, which by the way, are quite unclear. Um, and I've not had a, uh, I've not seen a, a test, uh, sorry, a precedent legal case yet where someone has just spoken to someone um, through their um, chat, pitched a JV, it gone wrong, gone to court and then lost in court. I've not seen a precedent of that yet. Um, but a little way round that, I did say I would probably go on some tangents, so bear with me. A little way round that, um, which works really well, is um, if someone's shown some interest in doing uh, some kind of JV with you, um, when you get to the point where it's time to talk about deals, you just push them away a bit. Now, often in selling, which ultimately you're doing here, pushing people away and make, making them want it a little bit more is effective. Um, so if someone, let's say Andreas says, hey Rob, I'm interested in a couple of the deals you've got, can we talk about doing a JV? The first thing I would say is, um, I'd love to, but FCA regs stop me from actually being able to show you any deals. Um, if I've got proof that you've got funds or you're a sophisticated investor, then we can talk about the deals. Um, so maybe if you could just send me uh, a little bit of proof about that, then we can you know, see if we can do a JV. Now, the thing about that is it pushes him away a bit. Now, if he wants to talk to me about a JV, but he's a bit of a chancer and he's got no money, he's not going to come back to me with any proof of funds or any sophisticated net, um, uh, investor um, proof uh, because he ain't got any money. And so that's quite a good way of me filtering him because, you know, your time is precious. You don't want to be having 10 conversations and nine of them, the person hasn't got any money and really they're just sort of trying to get some information out of you. And you just use very loose language. Um, now, those that do have the money, they can either forward you um, a sophisticated investor form, or they can just put on email um, that they are a high net worth investor. Now, Mark knows the exact specific um, technicalities of what you need to be a sophisticated investor. It's something like, I think, 250,000 pounds, not including your own home. Um, <laughs> I think there's a certain amount you have to have in liquid cash. It might be 100 grand, but I'm talking from memory. Uh, Mark knows the specific amount. Um, and then if they do send you some kind of, uh, hey, yeah, look, Rob, I've got the funds to invest. Uh, so, yeah, no worries. If you could just send me some kind of proof of funds, then we can look at doing some joint ventures together. Now, when it comes to joint ventures, there's two main ways of doing it. There's the joint venture where they've got equity. And then there's the straight loan. Uh, and sometimes the straight loan is easier. It's certainly cheaper, but there are certain types of uh, JV investors that will want equity. When Mark and I started, we borrowed money from my mum, Mark's mum, um, my uncle and Mark's stepdad. 
and we recycled that sort of every nine months to a year through property. So we borrowed a bit of cash from them multiple times. We bought our office, our second office, and we bought our training suite when we um, grew those uh, buildings and bought the buildings next door and knocked them through. We borrowed from Mark's dad for those. We bought one at 495, used his cash for that. Um, we, re we refinanced within about nine or 10 months because you know, there was no mortgage on it. We got a commercial loan on it. Um, we got it revalued at 800. So he got his 495 back plus 1% a month. So you know he made about 10%. He was quite happy to make 50 grand. We were quite happy to pay him 50 grand because we bought it for 495 and, it was, and we, we re revalued it at about 800 grand. Now we talked about commercial yesterday and commercial being lower value when there's no tenant. So yeah, we bought it well, but then we drew up a lease with progressive property and immediately increased the value. Um, so our parents and our family weren't really interested in JVs. Um, they were more interested in just getting a better use of their money. Um, we've got a couple of other partners who are maybe worth 10 million, 20 million plus. Um, one guy who sold his business and had a big uh, payout. Now, a couple of these investors that we've partnered with, they're very interested in property. So if they're very interested in property, that they may want to own it with you, part own it. Um, and, and I usually like to start from a 50-50 uh, and go from there. Um, some investors will say, hey, look, you know, I'll put 30% in, you put 20% in, or I'll put 40% in, um, you put, I don't know if I did the maths right there, that beep is really distracting me. Um, do you mind going and have a look, seeing what it is? Yeah, yeah. If it's the washing machine, just throw it out the window or something like that, you know. Um, and if it's that Hoover as well, it might be that vacuum cleaner. Um, just chuck it into the sea. Uh, so, yeah. Some, I've heard this quite a lot, where a JV partner, um, if it's 50, you want 50-50, they'll actually want you to put 10 or 20% of the money in. Um, and you do all the work. But I don't think that's equitable. Um, why would you do all the work and not get half the return? Now, a smart, savvy investor who's invested in a load of businesses might use the term blood money. They want you to have some money in it because you're vested. But um, you know, Mark and I, when we buy properties, we're vested in owning half the property and all the uplift. Um, so. Some investors may want a bit of blood money um, or skin in the game is another way that they call it that. But that is not obligatory uh, and that's up to you. Now, if an investor wanted me to put 5% in, 10% in, and it was a really big deal, I might consider that because the bigger the deal, the more risk of their money. Um, but I would say... 90% of the joint ventures, not money lending, but the joint ventures that I've seen in Progressive, they're just 50-50. Sarah puts all the money in, I do all the work. She's investing in my knowledge of the local area, my experience of doing deals, my ability to get good deals, um, a bit of trust and rapport and relationship that she thinks that I'm a good person to um, partner with. She could learn from me, and that is easily worth 50% of the deal. Also, the, the easiest JV to do in terms of clear lines of responsibility is, Sarah puts the money in, I do all the work. That's the clearest JV. If Sarah's saying like, Rob, I want you to put 10% of the money in, or 20% of the money in, I might feel like, well, that's now not quite equitable. I'd like you to do a bit of the work, but you probably don't want to do any of the work. And how do we draw tasks and roles and responsibilities for me to do 80% of the work and you to do 20? That's kind of a bit blurred. Now, the next thing is having more than one JV partner to access. If you only have one JV partner, then they have a little bit of negotiation power and leverage because you need their money they may know you need their money and that gives them a bit of power. If you had three partners, you can go to them all with your next deal. And if one wants a little bit more, you can just say, I have other partners I can go to for this deal. And so you have a little bit more of the, um, of the control. 
Um, I've definitely seen people give far too much away because they need the money. So trying to tie up and remember the loops I've opened. If we go back, I said, you wanna try and build relationships and find JV partners before you need the money. When you need the money, you probably sell a bit too much. Nothing wrong with selling, but you probably sell a bit too much. Um, but also, you're probably, you're probably just, uh, I don't really know any other way to say it other than pull your pants down a bit too much. Uh, you'll probably just give too much away. Were you just thinking about that then, Andreas? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like, for example, with bridging, if you're desperate for the money, you might end up paying 2% a month for money, 3% a month for money, but you didn't remember the setup fee and the exit fee. And then when you add all that in, you can be at 3 or 3.5% 3 a month. And that's way too much money. Way too much. Um, on really short-term money, talking three to six months, I don't really like paying any more than 2%. Um, and then on money for like a year, I don't really like paying more than 1% per month. We've never had to pay more than 1% for private finance. Um, bridging can be up to three, uh, but like I said, that's got to be really short term. Um, you'll often get into penalty interest on a bridging loan if you go beyond the, um, the agreed date as well. So this is another thing to note down, and that is be realistic with the amount of time you think it takes because if you say, oh, we'll get this done in a year and it takes two years and the, there's um, an extra 50% uplift in the interest rate after the time frame that you agreed, because a smart JV partner, they'll give you penalty interest after the agreed date, then that's going to cost you a lot of money. Mark and I have found that 1% a month, that's sustainable, that um, they're pretty happy with the t return, but you can make that money out of the deal. Because remember, if you borrow money, you've got to make the money out of the deal. Otherwise, you're paying the interest out of your pocket. So you've got to buy it well, below market value, or you've got to have an uplift in value. Now, if you're doing what Matt is looking to do, which is commercial conversion or development, you're creating the uplift either in the build or in the conversion. So that should be relatively easy to do. But you know, buying single lets, at full market value, you're not gonna be able to create any uplift. So, you know, you're, you're gonna be paying, that 10%'s gotta come probably from your pocket. Uh, so that's something to think about as well. Um, so where do we find these people then? I'm gonna reel off a list of places that I've found money. Uh, and then I'm gonna reel off after that a list of places that I know that other people have found money. Uh, and then I'm gonna suggest that you go to those places. So, Mark and I found money from Mark's mum. Now, of course, I didn't know when I met Mark that Mark's mum had money because I didn't know Mark's mum. So, um, you know, obviously, some of you, your parents may not be around, I get that, but it doesn't have to be mums, it can be family members. A lot of people discount family members. A lot of people, that's where they go first. There's no right or wrong, there's upsides and downsides of borrowing from family. Um, but Mark and I went to family first because, A, there was the opportunity there. Now, Mark and I didn't go to our family straight away. We did a few deals with actually Mark's money first. So I should, if I were to timeline this, the first place that I found money was Mark. Now, Mark definitely didn't tell me how much he had for quite a few months. But I took him out one night, got him really pissed, and he accidentally told me how much money he had in his bank. Um, and then woke up with a massive hangover, and I woke up really excited, and I was like, right, Mark, let's go and buy properties. Um, <laughs> and we bought about a dozen properties with his money, and then we ran out of his money, and then he panicked, and he was like, no more, Rob, no more, because I can be quite... Um, persuasive when I want to be. So I was like, no problem, let's go talk to your mum. And he was like, don't go talk to my mum, let's just wait. So I went and talked to his mum anyway, and then we got um, a few rounds of deposits out of his mum, and then she ran out. Um, and then I was like, well, what about your stepdad? And he was like, definitely don't go and speak to my stepdad. So I went and spoke to his stepdad, and we got another round of money out of uh, Mark's stepdad, <laughs> which, by the way, we've all paid them back. They make 10, sometimes 12, sometimes 14%, because they make a percent a month on their money. Um, so 
Mark, then Mark's mum, then Mark's stepdad, then my mum, because Mark sort of went back to me. We were about 20 properties at this point. He's like, oh, have you got you know, money in your family? And I said, well, I don't know. Um, my nan passed away. My nan passed some money on to my mum. My mum had semi-retired. My mum didn't really know what to do with the money. I didn't ask my mum for the money. My mum said to me, Rob, you're doing well in this property, Lark. Can you use my money? So she came to me. So um, this is the next thing you'll want to write down. And I told you this yesterday. Make sure you publicise your journey of what you do. Talk to people at networking events. Sarah, I saw you posted in the Progressive Community yesterday about think, your yeah, deal. Yeah. And they've got quite a lot of response. Yeah, not just on that, but on regular Facebook as well. Yeah. A huge response from friends and family. So, Great. Yeah. So on regular, on your Facebook, yeah. you posted that deal you did. Yeah. And your friends and family have had a good response. Yeah. And then you posted in the Progressive Community yeah. the deal you did. So I said around the table yesterday um, that... If you're quite experienced, you can give content and value and you can actually unpick a deal you did and you can go back. So Matt could go back over his first deal and he could go throw back Thursday. This was a deal I did three or four years ago. Just thought I'd share. I've been in Cayman with, with Rob and the guys, tag a few of them in and, and, and just sort of do a little bit of a synopsis of the deal. Now, that is really good value for the community. Tick. But it's also a good showcase social proof for you. And if you look in the Facebook community, the one I'm living in at the moment, you know, there's quite a few people who share their deals. Now, remember, I said yesterday, I think balance sharing your deals with giving some kind of value and education. Because when people just go, whoa, boom, another deal, it's amazing, make a million pound a minute, whoa, fuck yeah, high five, um, give me a like, um, that's fine. And actually, it probably does work to build their um, brand and reputation and um, if you don't tell people about the deals you've done, they'll never know. But I think if you weave a bit of information and education as well, I think it just comes across a bit better because people can get value from your posts. So you've got to showcase your journey on your own social media, in the progressive social media, um, in other property groups, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, etc. And then over time, three months, six months, People are going to connect with you and it works. It actually works better than you pushing to them. Sarah, you had that yesterday, didn't you? You had someone who well, you, you, um, basically said, follow what you do, love what you do, can yeah. I follow what you do? Yeah. Um, so Mark and I went and bought some properties for a few months. Because Mark had a bit of money, the only person I needed to pitch to was Mark and I didn't really need to pitch to him because we kind of got in this together um, and sort of two or three months in, Mark had watched me and realised that actually I was probably a good partner for him to have. Um, so we just started buying properties together. I was telling everyone about it because that's not really Mark's style. And then that's what attracted my mum. And then my mum attracted my uncle because my uncle got left half of the money, obviously, that my nan uh, passed down. And so then he invested. Then one of my dad's friends who he was in a horse racing syndicate with invested just because they, I was quite out there publicising what we were doing. Now, in the early days, I was probably quite, um, I wasn't that elegant. I was just like, look, look at what we're doing, look at what we're doing, tell everyone what we're doing, look at what we're doing, look at what we're doing. But it worked. Now I try and always inform and educate as well as just look at what we're doing, look at what we're doing. So um, any deal you do, share the upsides and the downsides, share what you learned, share some of, the, some of the mistakes as well as the wins. People will learn from that. People will realise you're honest and balanced and you will start to have them trickle down and find you. Yesterday, I went round the table and asked where you'd all found me. And half of you in this room found me through my money book. Some of you had found me through uh, my podcast. Some of you had found me through other books of mine. So you're here because you paid between zero and 10 pounds and you got a lot of information from me over a period of time, a month, six months, a year. So you were able to sit back, who's this Rob guy? Turn him on, wow, he's a bit loud, I'm not sure if I like him, hmm. All right, we'll give him a go. Get past that, he sounds like he's been shouting a lot, he's very hoarse with his voice. Um, at maybe two, three, five hours in, you're like, oh, there's some quite good content here, this is all right. 10, 20 hours in when you hear the personal stories and everything else and you realize I've actually shared everything where I live, you know, everything, all right, well, I could probably trust this guy now and if not, I know where he lives, so this is okay. Um, and you can do all this in your own time because people check Facebook when they want to check it. People listen to audiobooks and podcasts 
when they want to listen to audiobooks and podcasts. So you, you, you're not pitching to them, they're consuming your information in their leisure. Now, if you do Facebook ads to try and raise finance, Facebook ads are interrupting people. Now, of course, Facebook ads work, but they're more attritional um, and people complain about them as well as, uh, you know, become one of your followers. So just diary, diary video, pictures, articles, diary your journey as you do it. I've seen many of you around here in Cayman, you've been posting that you're here, that's great. You guys have been doing some lives, which is great. And if you do that enough, people will come to you. Uh, so back to this thread that we've opened, found money from my mum, my uncle, Mark's mum, Mark's stepdad, um, a friend of my dad's who was in a horse racing syndicate with. Uh, we recycled that and went again with that, of course, Mark as well. Um, and then our first JV partner who was non-family was someone who came to one of our courses, sort of sat at the back, wanted to get into property. Um, he was quite quiet and reserved. Didn't sort of market the fact that he was, you know, he had a load of money and he was looking to get into JVs. I spoke to him on the phone every few months. He had a foreign exchange business. He said that he was looking to sell that and just every sort of two or three months, I just kept in touch with him. He sometimes messaged me, I sometimes um, uh, called him up. He was quite interested in watches, so I gave him a bit of help and advice on watches. And then one day he phoned up, actually he sent his wife on a couple of our courses as well. And then one day he phoned up and said, I've sold my company, I've got a load of money, what should we do? And I said, well, you should have a chat with Mark. We're buying a couple of deals. Mark took him around a couple of deals and we did a joint venture. We bought a 34 unit HMO conversion. He put all the money in, uh, in the purchase and the refurb. Mark managed the whole project end to end. Uh, and then we refinanced, got all of his money back out and he earns 50% of the income and we earn 50% of the income. Um, we invited him to go into a future deal and um, he wasn't quite ready for that. I think maybe it was the size and the scale of it. Um, so he would definitely be someone that we could do more deals with in the future if we wanted. Um, I told you, didn't I, that there was a, a, a golfer who's really high up in the rankings um, that we were structuring a JV with as, as well. So as I guess I've got a, a wider reach and built a brand, I've managed to find people. So Kevin Clifton from Strictly Come Dancing found me through Life Leverage. Um, this very, very high ranked golfer, like in the top 10, like in the top five. Um, his sister read one of my books and related to the golf stories that I put in there about Bobby. Um, so it's funny when you tell everyone what you do and you put content out there, um, you attract people you, that you don't know are following you. Um, I have quite a few celebrities that follow me and someone who was on, you know, these superhero um, X-Men type TV shows is someone who follows me who's on those. I didn't even know and I'm doing a podcast with her. I'll find her name for you soon. Um, so putting yourself out there um, I did a live yesterday and a, a fair bit of content on how to be an influencer. Um, and I think if you build towards making yourself, influence is a word that some people don't really like. So you can call it an influencer, you can just call it a content marketer, you can just say someone who puts a diary online, a video and article diary online once a week, three times a week, on what you do. Call it what you want, whatever you're comfortable with owning. I, I don't like to call myself an influencer. I feel like that's a bit self-aggrandizing. Um, I would definitely say I'm someone who puts a lot of content out there. Um, now, if you put content out on social media, it doesn't cost you anything, so it's only your time. Um, and make sure you put content out there linked to the people you want to attract. So don't keep doing content on no money down if you want to raise a few hundred grand because you'll attract people who haven't got any money and want to do no money down. So you want to make sure that, um, you know, if you're looking to attract millionaires or people who've got a few hundred grand or people who want to replace their pension and have got, you know, maybe a, a redundancy payment or they've sold a business, 
you want to make sure that your content wraps that in so that it attracts that people, those kind of people. You know, the, the best kind of um, attraction marketing and finding what you might call your ideal JV partner is to communicate in your content, in their language, putting their specific needs and desires in your content. Um, so, you know, when you're doing your content, you might say, I don't do deals under a quarter of a million pounds because I don't find that they're great leverage. So I tend to do deals between 250 grand and half a million. Um, I know you've done one at sort of GDV of two million at the moment. So when you say that, you don't attract people who can't do a 250 grand deal because you've said, I don't do deals under 250. Or you could say, I've bought a lot of single lets in my career over the years. I'm now scaling up and doing bigger developments. So in a way, that's just gently pre-qualifying, attracting people who could only afford a single let. Um, you could do content on if you've been made redundant, what do you do with the money? You could do content on if you've sold your business, what do you do with the money? We did a session um, for Julia about how I felt it was good to use the money that she's got. Um, so you do content on that and you attract that kind of person. Cool. So at this stage, as you're watching, has anyone got any questions? Um, I've got loads more, but I think if I chuck a couple of questions in, um, and just while we're thinking of questions, let me just show you the view. And this is not to gloat. Actually, that's a pretty gloat-worthy view, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, great. So, yeah, hit me. Have you got any questions? So you've talked about single investors. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. I also didn't finish where to find the money, did I? I got to family. Um, so let me finish that. So I'll answer this. Um, so Ash has just asked me, um, how, what, what about multiple investors? So Mark and I, about seven years ago, um, went through the process of setting up a fund. Uh, and the legal fees were eye-watering, like 85 grand, probably just get to get it actually started. Hugely regulated. Um, you know, the marketing that you can do is very, very restricted. And I mean, imagine me being restricted in marketing. Uh, and um, the returns that you can give are quite low, really. So Mark and I have never been interested in funds or collective investments. But let's say we needed, let's say, a million quid. Um, and therefore, that was going to be 10 people at 100 grand or something like that. We just do individual loan agreements so now by the way when you you might negotiate different deals with different individuals so when when you have three different individuals you probably don't want to get them together because if i'm paying matt one percent a month and i'm paying dean 0.8 percent a month as soon as dean knows he wants one percent a month um so I'll generally just, if, I'm, if I need more than one investor, I will just do a loan with them individually. Now the challenge then becomes security, because, um, I mean, look, if you, if you buy cash, you can offer first charge, but if you've got three people, you've got to, you've got to agree their security. So you could have an RX1 restriction on the property, that's pretty easy to do. Um, you could give one a first charge and one a second charge if one is investing more money than the other. If you give really good security, I think you should, by the way, even if they don't ask, um, because it commits you and it makes them feel safe. Um, when it comes to a joint venture, we only ever do it with one person and we only ever do it if they've got the whole um, purchase price. So, I mean, if you're doing a joint venture and they put the deposit in, You've got to go through all that rigmarole of applying to get a mortgage and proving where the funds come from. And the way that they question of source of funds, if they know that you borrowed it from a JV partner, you might get declined on the mortgage. You need a really good mortgage broker and really good technical advice. And you don't want to fall, fall foul of then accidentally committing mortgage fraud by not filling the form in properly. Um, and then you've got the mortgage company has first charge. So the investor can only have a second charge or a restriction. We've never had to actually put more than one investor into a deal. 
So if someone says, look, I've got 50 grand, I'd say, okay, well, maybe we should talk in the future because that's not enough for this deal. And I'd kind of, you know, keep them a little bit at bay. When the investor can buy the whole property for cash, they can get a first charge, you can do it really quickly, which means you can buy a cheaper deal. Um, and, the, and then the refinance is way easier. And it's easier to keep one partner happy than it is three or four partners happy. Um, now, what a lot of people do, and they do inadvertently make this mistake, is they're negotiating a deal and they say, oh, you know, we need a deposit of 35 grand. And if the purchase price was 120 and we need a deposit of 35 grand, and I've just told Andreas the deposit's 35 grand, that's what he needs, he's going to go, yeah, all right, I'll invest 35 grand. He's not going to pay the whole purchase price, even if he's got the money. So always start with what the purchase price is and say, uh, you know, look, if we can buy it cash, we can get it quick and we can get a better deal because you can always get a better deal with cash. Yeah. It actually is true. I think it makes a difference of f between five and 10% on the purchase price on average because you can buy it quicker. So don't accidentally push money away by only requesting the deposit. Re always request the cap, the full purchase price first. Cool, all right. Um, so let me carry on with uh, where, you f where we found the money. I think I've covered five or six people so far. Um, and then I'll take any other questions you've got. So, uh, London Business Angels and Angels Den. Uh, Mark and I used to go especially to London Business Angels quite a lot. And we met some really big heavyweights there. Angels, dragons, some of them also known as vultures, managers of funds, VCs, the lot. Um, so I would definitely try and find a local Business Angels meeting. Um, I've gone to the one in Cambridge. Um, Mark and I have gone to the Angels Den and the London Business Angels in uh, London. I know there's an Angels Den in Scotland. Now, this, this is quite important. If you go to London Business Angel or any kind of Angels Den, um, they will ask you, are you an investor? You know, or are you sort of looking to pitch for money? Now, this is somewhat, I wouldn't say cheeky, but... I told them when I first went that I was an investor because I thought they meant I'm a property investor. Um, when in fact what they were asking is, am I there to seek money or to invest money? So I'm now known as an investor who's investing money even though I was there to seek money and I've got the right badge. And all of a sudden I'm sort of positioned more as a person who's the investor than seeking the investment. And that ended up being good to meeting the other investors and talking to the other investors because they can see you're an investor. Um, now, when they know that you're looking for money, their business model is you pay them, I think, 500 quid and you get to pitch. And actually, if you did that a, a few times, you'd probably get some investment. But that's like you're the cattle and you've been branded and you're walking around the ring and you're the animal up for auction being watched by everyone else. So even though you'll probably raise money, I've had a message from Mark, I wonder if he's had his baby. Whoa, oh, has he had his baby, has he had his baby? Oh. Um, so you wanna go in there to meet the investors, but ideally you don't wanna pitch early because they'll always look at you as the person who's looking for the money, which is fine, but the, the, the guys with the money probably feel like they have control. So you go there, you meet investors, you build your network, and then you develop relationships with them outside of the network. And that's probably the best way. Um, charity balls and flying clubs. So Mark and I met quite a lot of really wealthy people at our local flying club when we were learning to fly. Um, and I told you, didn't I, I go to Justin Rose's charity ball, I go to Jake Wood's charity ball. And there's, there's a, a mass of really um, wealthy and successful and inspiring people there. Um, so I'll definitely get along to those if you can. Um, property networking events. So Progressive Property Networks uh, work really well for people. I know Glenn Delve raised a good amount of money from his Southampton PPN. I know most of the PPN hosts have raised good money from the front of the room. There's the independent meets as well. Um, so there's other property network meets. Now, when you go to property network meetings, you will find money there, but it, you'll have to sift through because maybe 80% of the people are looking for money and 20% of people have got the money. But general networking, you have to do that anyway. 
you know, if you meet 100 people, that's not 100 JV partners you're going to meet. You know, out of that 100 people, 10 to 15 of them may have a decent amount of money and half of them, you know, seven, six, might actually have good rapport with you to want to invest with you. Now, I'm continually gobsmacked how many people go to networking events and don't talk to anyone or talk only to the people that they know or do talk to other people, get a business card and then never follow up with that person. Now, none of this stuff is a eureka moment that's going to make you run around this villa like, you, you know, you, it would have been worth paying double for. But how many people to go to networking events and actually, you know, think, OK, I'm going to try and spend five to ten minutes with as many people as I can. I'm going to stay late. My goal is by the end of this, um, I've spoke to half the people because you can't probably speak to everyone because otherwise it's a bit too fast. And then I'm going to sit down the next day and get all the business cards out. I'm going to input them all into my CRM. Um, and then I'm going to either email or call everyone. Just say, hi, it's Rob. I was wearing the um, top with the stars on it because it's nice to have something memorable so they can remember you. Um, and just say, um, it was just nice to meet you. I'm not really calling for anything in specific other than just to say, most people don't follow up after networking events. And I think you should. How did you, how did you get on? Blah, blah, blah. Is there anything I can help you with? So the networking meeting is step one. That loose, general, friendly chat is step two. And I always ask them if there's anything I can help them with. Because one, it's law of reciprocity, but two, you'll probably find out some stuff. Now, step nine might be when you talk about business, or step seven, but you've got to get there. So for every hundred people you meet, if you follow up properly, you're probably going to have five to ten that are JV worthy, or are investors. Business networking events. So generally in a, in a town or city, there are two types of business networking events. There's the sort of the lower end one where, where the companies are like IT, print, etc. cetera. Um, and, and I haven't found that much money from those. Then there's the higher end one. So I told you about that commercial um, property agent in Peterborough who seems to be really well connected, who also runs a commercial property networking event. And at that event, there were a lot of sort of the higher end investors and business people in Peterborough. Like in London, there's the Institute of Directors and there's other higher end ones. So what you want to do in your local town or city um, is try and find all the business networking events and go and test them all out. So in Peterborough, there was business for breakfast. There was the business club. And then there was, then there's this commercial property one. There are a couple of others, but they were the main three. And the, the business for breakfast was the sort of the, the, the lower end one. The business club was the mid one. Um, and then this commercial one was the higher end one. Uh, and again, go there, network, get connected. Um, once you find one person who's got a really successful business or is quite a prolific property investor, they'll know everybody else. And once you get to know them a bit, you just ask them, who else is doing a lot in property? And they'll just give you the names. And before you know it, three or four months down the line, you know, everyone's always talking about the big names. So in Peterborough, uh, when Neville Wright sold Kitty Care for 100 million, you couldn't go to a business networking event without someone saying Neville's name. So if you were new, you'd go there, and within half, I mean, everyone, Neville Wright is buying up half of Peterborough. Neville Wright's sold kiddie care for 75 million. Neville Wright's worth 100 million. You know, Neville Wright's developing this. Neville Wright's doing that. Couldn't go without hearing his name. And there's three or four other people. And I think Mark's in that category now of people talking about Mark because he's do, developing quite a lot of big buildings. So it won't take you long to find out who all the well-connected uh, people are and then you just reach out you you go and add them on LinkedIn you add them on Facebook you connect with them you reach out you say hey did you know we're both from Peterborough because you know when you connect with someone on LinkedIn it's almost like oh that's weird we're both from Peterborough whereas if you met them at a networking event they might be a bit like at first um, so connect with them on all their social media comment on some of their stuff uh, and then you'll probably build quite a you'll just I think it takes nine to 12 touch points for you to build a bit of trust with someone. And, and that's gone up, it used to be less, because people I think are probably a little bit less trusting now. And also if you think about how everyone's running ads and the internet and all the schemes and scams that are out there. Mm. 
Uh, now, actually, at, at, at the lower end, a business networking event in Peterborough we went to, the, the um, business for breakfast, I stood up and, and you know you get your 30-second elevator pitch. I know I haven't done this elevator pitch for about 14 years, but I scripted it word for word. So, hi, I'm Rob Moore. Um, we're property investors. This is my business partner, Mark Comer. We help you invest for freedom, choice, and profit. We save you time and make you money by helping you invest and building a hands-free property portfolio that you could maybe one day retire and enjoy more financial independence. So if you want to have a chat, come and see me in the break. That is word for word. You know like when you were a kid and you learned poetry and you had to memorise a poem? Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the weeb. <laughs> um, I haven't said that for 32 years. <laughs> so it sticks in your brain. And so like you want to sort of memorise a very top level, interesting, hopefully enticing elevator pitch, but it sounds conversational. Definitely don't get up and read a sheet of paper. And a guy called Lyndon Wright came up to me and he said, all right, mate, I'm Lyndon, I do IT and web posting and Google AdWords. And he was like a really high energy guy. Uh, I want to get into property, we should talk, here's a business cover. And he pinged off and went and talked to loads of people. I went back, I followed up, I called him, he came to the office uh, and we sold him about nine deals. Um, so that was quite a good JV. And he, he had our IT contract for about 10 years. So it's a pretty good JV either way. And that was pretty much the first guy at the first business networking event I went to. Um, so yeah, business networking events can work quite well. The good thing about business networking events is they don't have as many property people in. So when you stand up and do your elevator pitch, you're usually the only property person. So that can be an advantage. Okay, great. So, um, any questions? Mark's just said he misses being here. We miss you, Mark. Do you all miss Mark? Yes. I take it you haven't had your baby yet, then, if you're watching this live. Can you just let us know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, any questions about joint ventures and raising JV funds? I'll just go for as long as you want. I wouldn't say it's so much a question, but I've done the year on Banksy's twice, and I'd say that it's really helpful. Yeah. Dives right in, didn't it, for yeah. 15 hours, so... So um, Adam has just said that he listened to the Be Your Own Bank audio program um, and he said that was really helpful. So it's a, a full deep dive on all things raising JV finance. Um, you can find that online. Um, it's about eight years ago, I did a finance raising course, two grand course, um, because obviously finance raising is a massive part of property. I did a couple of those. Uh, they weren't really easy to sell, so I had to do a lot of work to fill a course. And I worked out because the people who wanted to do the finance raising course were often people who maybe didn't have access to a lot of finance. So what I did was the last course I ever ran, I just recorded the whole course and I thought I'll, I'll um, reduce the price and I'll sell it on an audio program um, because I thought that was a good way to give back to the community. I've updated it three times. We added the new FCA reg section in as well. Um, so it's basically a two grand finance raising course for less than 100 quid on a set of audio, um, uh, uh, on a set of audio CDs. So just have a quick look at the view. Nice view there, sorry. Um, I actually might have just whispered it right into the microphone. Um, so yeah, mate, you, if you, um, you can find that online. It's called um, Joint Venture Be Your Own Bank. Um, you thought it was good, did you, Adam? Very good. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, twice. You, did, you listen to it twice. Yeah. Um, often people who I'm mentoring and they're looking to raise finance, I say, when you drive to see me at VIP and when you drive home, put the Be Your Own Bank on in the car um, uh, and play it on repeat until you can kind of memorise it. I remember listening to Tony Robbins, Get the Edge. This was 14 years ago. I played it on repeat so much, I could actually recite what he was going to say when he was going to say it. Now, when you can recite the nine structures of a JV, um, the, this is not an offer, offer. The, um, the under the radar um, sort of sales techniques, if you like, um, when you know how to do them habitually without even thinking about it, you'll find it easier to raise finance. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? You can also ask questions if you are uh, on the live. Let's have a look. No, everyone's just asking if Mark's had his baby yet. 
I've got a question. Yeah. Going back to um, the multiple investors and the fact that you and Mark don't have multiple investors on one deal, if you were to do that, would it not be an idea to just buy that property into an SPV and um, have a shareholders agreement for everybody? Okay, good question. So, uh, could you buy a property in an SPV and have a shareholders agreement? I think if you're doing bigger deals, that's exactly what you should do. Uh, and I think if you've got multiple JV partners, that's what you should do. Um, so we will set up a separate property company, give it a different name to Progressive, uh, and we will have our joint venture partner as a 50% shareholder and have a separate agreement. And then Mark will be a 25% shareholder and I'll be a 25% shareholder. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's how we'll do it. Um, there's probably some legal and technical reasons why that's beneficial, which would be for Mark to comment on, because yeah. um, that's more his area than mine, but that is what we do. Yeah. Good. And then... That's what I've done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. You, you got a load of questions, Matt? You must have. Not, not specifically about this, but... Okay. Anyone else got any questions about joint ventures? We've definitely got joint ventures from the progressive community. That would be nice right. Piece, yes. So, so uh, someone has just mentioned here in the room that they've got joint venture partners from the progressive community. There are, I, I can't even say how many. It must be hundreds. It may be thousands of joint ventures going on in the progressive community. Um, and people... The thing with JVs is, it's the sort of thing when you've never raised any money, you're always like, well, it might be all right for you, someone else might be able to do it, but what about me? I've just started, you know, why would anyone invest in me? But you know, every master was once a disaster, every, be every winner was once a beginner. Um, and here's something interesting to think about JVs is, like, I learned about five years ago, people were starting to do JVs and starting to get the courses and the training of people that Mark and I had taught rather than Mark and I. And if Mark and I have taught the people to invest in property and build their portfolio, why would someone invest in them and not us when we taught them? And like, I found that quite interesting. Now, here are some things that you wanna think about when understanding why people invest. And I created a little model called Crest to illustrate it. So you, you as an individual find it really hard to get past the fact that anyone would invest for any other reason other than the reason you would invest. Because we see the world not as it is, but as we are. So if you're quite sceptical and you never do a deal without a first charge, you find it hard to comprehend why anyone else would. If you would only ever invest in someone who had 20 years experience, you could not understand why someone would JV with someone who hasn't done a deal yet. But I can promise you, there are all types. So, and they're not usually, there's rarely an investor who needs this all covered. They're usually one or two of these five things. So some people invest in credibility, that's the C. They're looking for you to be credible. Now, let's take Matt's example. Let's imagine Matt hadn't done any of his own investments, even though he has. Matt's got a building company. So that's still credible. Even if he hasn't done his own deals, he's got a building company. Um, you know, some of you around this room have got very successful non-property businesses. That's credible. So credibility isn't just you've done loads of deals. It's, are you a credible person? Now, if I went round the table and said, what makes a credible person to you? You're probably all going to say a different word. In fact, let's do it just for fun. So Sarah, one word, what makes a credible person to you? Integrity. Integrity. Okay, which is not proof. So would you rather invest in someone who'd done 50 deals and was sly and slippery or no deals but had full integrity in your opinion? No deals. No deals, integrity. but integrity. Yeah. If Mark Homer was here, he'd look at you like you're kind of crazy. And he'd say, I don't really care if they're a bit sly and slippery because I'll get a first charge. They've done 50 deals. They know how to do the deals. I'm investing. <laughs> so that, that's really interesting. Yeah. Ash, what about you? Track record. Track record. So we've got integrity, track record. Kim, what about you? 
Integrity. Integrity. Hon honesty. So there's another word that's come up there. Mm. Honesty. So if, if honesty is important to Kim, Kim probably isn't going to get too het up if things go slightly wrong, as long as he's not, as long as not lied to. If he's told the truth early, he can probably move with that. Would that be fair to say? Perfect. Yeah, cool. Matt, what about you? One word for credibility. What makes someone credible to you if you're investing your money? Uh, experience. There you go, so experience. So we've got four different words here. What about you, Sean? I like them to be an expert in their field. Right, an expert. And now here's the thing with an expert, that is completely subjective. Yeah. You know, what makes an expert? What makes an expert to you? Usually someone who's been in business for a while and they'll know a lot of, lot of knowledge. Yeah, so a lot of knowledge. Here's the thing, and everyone needs to take note of this. Um, you could get a, not a, lot, a lot of knowledge without a lot of experience. And you could read a lot of books and go on some courses and in six months you can sound like you've got loads of experience because you've got a lot of knowledge. I'm not saying you're trying to baffle people, but if you learn all the lingo quick and you read books and you go on courses and you sound like you know what you're doing because you said knowledge, so that's... What specifically do you need for their mindset? It's probably all of the rest of everything into one Yeah. So, um, growth mindset. Yeah, growth mindset. So I definitely like to invest in people who um, don't complain and throw their toys out of the pram when they have a problem, but they're fixers. Because I know things will go wrong. But if they fix them, that's obviously positive. Uh, Julia, what about you? What makes someone credible? Ah. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people, eight with me, eight different words for the same thing, which is credibility. So, trustworthiness. Okay, so would you rather invest in someone who's done 50 deals and absolutely un unequivocally has proven that they can do the deals, but they're a liar and you can't trust them, or no deals, but they're trustworthy? I cannot do it if they were liars. So, you couldn't do it if they weren't trustworthy? No? Now, here's the thing. Can someone who's never done any deal be trustworthy? Of course they can. So your assets when you haven't done any deals are trustworthiness, honesty, integrity. Now in this room, there's at least three people who would invest in someone with no deals if they have integrity, honesty, trustworthiness. What about you chaps? Uh, trustworthy, can you give me a soon as you say that? Trustworthy, yeah. Uh, from our comment, then I, I think about experience as well. So it'd be a combination of that. So a bit of trust, a bit of experience. Get, done, no matter what. get the deal done no matter what. So we'll just do what it takes. Whatever it takes. Yeah. Now, by the way, you can judge if someone will do whatever it takes by looking at what they do in the other areas of their life. How you do anything is how you do everything. So if some of you post stuff and you almost have a hashtag whatever it takes and you talk about how you turned a deal around, or how you had a massive problem and you fixed it, someone else can look at that and go, this person will do whatever it takes. Cool, so that's just covered the seat. R is return. Some people are looking for a return. E is exit. Some people wanna know out and get their money out before they put their money in. S is security. With Mark, it's always security first. I.e., can I get a charge? First charge, second charge, not good enough. And then we can talk. Now, by the way, I'm totally happy to give a charge away because it shows that I believe in the deal. Um, I don't want to make any money on a deal or a venture unless my partner makes money as well because to me, that's not, that's not sustainable. I want to be in this business for 60 years. It doesn't show integrity. Um, I don't, you know, and they're risking their money. I'm risking my time and I can get my time back. They can't get their money back. Um, and then T is trust. Trust is a big one. For a lot of human beings, trust is the biggest thing. Trust that many of you would usurp experience. Mike, or Mikey has asked, if you're looking to get started with property, social media, and the rest of it, what would you do first to attract potential new deals and investors? Would you wait? Uh, or would you start to build your brand? I would start to build your brand now. I like, if I was new to property, and I wanted to build some awareness to raise JV finance, what I'd do is, I'd try and share my journey on social media I'd try and teach what I learn at the same time. 
and I tried to make myself not look like as much of a newbie as I was, I would not lie, but like, let's say I went on a viewing. I might say, just met an estate agent, went on five viewings. I didn't realize X, Y, and Z, and that was a good lesson for me. And so I would teach what I'm learning. And then someone can see your journey. So no, I wouldn't wait, Mikey, I'd get right on it. What would I do, if, what would I do first to attract potential new deals and investors? Ah, this is the chicken and egg question no one's asked me. I'm surprised you haven't. What comes first? The deal or the money? <laughs> Don't know what I did there. Um, so I think both. Because if you find a deal, you're probably motivated to find the money. But if you build the relationships before you have the deal, when you have the deal, you'll have the money. But if you find the money and you haven't got a deal, you've got motivation to go out and do a few extra viewings and get a deal tied up. So I would say do both simultaneously because one affects the other positively. If you find a deal, you're gonna, you're gonna step up. You're gonna go to more networking events. You're gonna um, get online. You heard me talking about charity balls and business uh, angel meets and you sort of put that on ice for a bit and you're actually going, do you know what, I'm gonna go to one now because you've got a deal there and you don't wanna let the estate agent down. So I'd do them concurrently. Ash. Yeah. Um, so we talked about SPVs So I've got a goal society that I want to invest and I want to help them invest the money. So trying to sort of structure that. Yeah. It, obviously people many people want to come in and out of that. Is that is that so, a fund type deal or is that a, yeah. a, a SPV type deal? So we've talked about uh, a lot of people a, a golf society want to come into a deal. Max um, ten. Sorry? Max ten. Max ten. I know that would scare Mark silly. I know that would, um, just because of the, the regulations. Um, how much do they all want to put in? Are they all going to put the same amount of money in? If that were me, I'd completely avoid that. And I'd, also, I'd just try and talk to them individually. That's what I would do. Um, yeah, because one might have half a million quid and one might have 10 grand. And you, you are, if you're doing collective investments, the rules, are on another level, yeah. Also, and I know this is a little bit sort of worst case scenario, but if you get them all together, they all invest a bit, and it doesn't quite go so well, you've got to find a new golf club. <laughs> Which is, but the thing is, with, te with those 10 people, imagine in, with those 10 people, you have one who's a bit of a stickler, uh, uh, you know, what's, what's going on all the time? Oh, this is my last 20 grand, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, oh, did you know it's not going so well? And you could just totally get everyone else affected. Whereas if you go to them individually, there's, there's not. Yeah. Okay, um, Tanvir just said, be your own bank is very good, the audio program, so make sure you get on that if you haven't already. Just search JV, be your own bank online. Anyone, anyone else with any questions? All right, great. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I know it was a long one, and um, just over an hour. Remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. <laughs>